Christmas, Oakland City Church. I hope you're having a wonderful morning so far. I hope that you've been able to spend this part of the morning with people that are special in your life, be it family, friends, a neighbor. It is really wonderful to be able to spend the next hour with you worshiping God together. We're going to begin this morning by um, having Pastor Gent lead us in a reading. So let's go to Pastor Gent. Good morning, Oakland City Church, and Merry Christmas. It is a, a joy to celebrate with you this morning the birth of our Savior. Uh, this morning, um, I'd like to read a, a short passage that helps us to reflect on the nature of what we're celebrating on this day, and then lead us through a short breath prayer practice to help center ourselves just briefly this morning as we open gifts and celebrate um, so that we don't forget to point of what God is doing among us and in us today. This reading is entitled, God Loved Humans Enough to Become One. There are truly unlimited strategies that God could have used to rescue humanity, but the one that God chose was proximity. God has always wanted to be close to people, but we have preferred to confine God to tabernacles and temples, seminaries, and churches. But in the incarnation, Jesus cuts through all that religious pomp and circumstance by choosing to love us up close rather than far away. God goes from being seemingly inaccessible and abstract to as tangible as our friends and neighbors. Love as modeled by Jesus is a deep honoring of each person's humanity in the fullness of who they are, not in spite of it. It is not some hyper-spiritualized love that meets us when we are at our most spiritual, but that shows up in unexpected people bestowing honor, love, and acceptance on all. God loved humans enough to become one. And church, this morning I invite you to take a few deep breaths and just take a moment to center ourselves. I'm going to lead us in a quick breath prayer practice. We're going to inhale and speak the words, you accept me, and then exhale, I am loved. So let's breathe in, you accept me, I am loved. Again, inhale, you accept me, I am loved. And one last time, inhale, you accept me, I am loved. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gent, for sharing your gifts with us. Now we're going to have Donald share his offering, Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and heaven and nature sing.
McDonald for sharing that beautiful song with us this morning. Now, my husband, Richard Perez, is going to be reading our scripture lesson for us this morning. Our scripture reading is from Luke 2, 4 through 20. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Christmas blessings, Oakland City Church. You might have noticed during this Advent season that we've had some really beautiful and diverse images each week of Mary and Elizabeth. These images assert a breadth of diversity and creativity. Elder Joy did such a fantastic job of selecting images which help us to enter into the stories of Luke in special and fresh ways. I invite you to go to Instagram and Facebook pages to take a look at them if you haven't seen them already. As I was preparing for my sermon today, I was remembering some other evocative pictures I have seen over the years of Mary and Joseph. In particular, some paintings done by artist Kelly Lattimore. Lattimore specializes in iconography. He has painted both biblical figures in surprising ways, as well as exploring the holiness and presence of God in modern folks. His works include a painting of Mary holding the crucified Jesus, with Jesus being depicted as George Floyd, as well as beautiful yet simple paintings of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Frederick Douglass, and Maya Angelou, all pictured as saints. Lattimore says this of his work. My hope is that these icons do what all art can potentially do, which is create more dialogue. By transcending our biases, listening, and having inner silence about our convictions, our inherited traditions, or our favorite ideas, we can become open to the patterns of work, knowledge, and experience we may not have seen in the other or buried in ourselves. The other may have something to teach us about what we know, about who God is, and the world we live in, and who are our neighbors. This is the real work of being human and of art, being more present. There are two paintings that I want to share with you in particular. The first is a drawing of Mary and Joseph as refugees. It is called Refugees, La Sagrada Familia. Uh, perhaps you've even seen this one before. 
Their faces embody such faithfulness and assuredness even as you see the fear. It reminds me that experiencing fear in really challenging seasons doesn't discount our faithful actions. And Lattimore has another one called Holy Family of Streets. It depicts Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus as part of the unhoused community. And how striking the tenderness is in their faces and their body language, even with how cold the weather is. What I love about images like Lattimore's and the ones Elder Joy used is that they paint a holy window, enabling us to see perspectives in scripture we might have otherwise missed. They put the people ignored in our world front and center. And for thousands of years, the experiences and perspectives of certain people have been dismissed by those with power in our Christian world. The primacy of biblical understanding has centered on the perspectives of well-meaning, but sometimes myopic views from people like white male theologians and pastors. But here, in art like this, these important viewpoints are front and center, and they break open what I believe is a critical viewpoint for understanding scripture. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jet preached a really compelling perspective about Joseph. And one of his points was that by marrying a pregnant, uh, pregnant Mary, Joseph was willingly entering into a relationship that would bring dishonor to his family. Even in scripture, he is not described with the honoring title father. He is identified by his relationship to a woman. He is called husband. And this is unheard of otherwise in scripture. When you consider the very real possibility that the cost of marrying Mary was to bring shame and dishonor upon Joseph's family, it opens up some other possibilities for our scripture today. Joseph and Mary have come to Bethlehem to register for the census. Bethlehem is Joseph's hometown. And in a society that puts hospitality as its most prized value and family as the foundation of their economy and identity, why did no extended family open up their homes to Mary and Joseph? Had they heard about Mary's scandalous pregnancy and wanted nothing to do with it? Or maybe there was some sort of division in their family from which no one could heal? But something serious is happening here. No one will help them. No one will give them aid. No one will give a man and a young woman about to give birth any minute a room and a bit of compassion. Can you imagine the panic that faith mingled with fear that plagued Joseph and Mary's heart that night as Mary went into labor? No family, no friends, no doula, no midwife, no clergy, no care to help Mary in the most vulnerable moment of her life. Even the most faithful follower of God might have cried out during those contractions, God, have you forsaken me? Holy family in the streets, indeed. But God is faithful. The God who in the garden said, it is not good for humans to be alone, creates family when no family was to be found. The scripture tells us the shepherds said, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. Shepherds show up when no one else would. Dirty, smelly shepherds. 
And can't you just see them ooing and eyeing over their baby? Giving their cloaks to a shivering Mary, sharing what food and water they might have had, and giving an encouraging hug to Joseph. We learn here that God is embarrassingly and shockingly inclusive in who is called family. In the first century, shepherds were not considered desirable company. They were poor, illiterate, and thought to be dishonorable because they could not be home at night to protect their women. And they were also considered thieves because they grazed their flocks on other people's property. They were outcasts of polite society, usually ranked together with sailors, butchers, camel drivers, and other despised occupation. But isn't this just like God? To take people who others say are shameful and call them sons and daughters. Isn't it just like God to have the revelation of who God is be forged in the company of outcasts? The news of Jesus' birth is for all people, not just the powerful and elite. And the foundation of the incarnation takes roots in the lives of the lowly and the outcasts. The shepherds go to Bethlehem to find this baby, and when they do, they become the chosen family of Mary, Joseph, and the first to share the good news of the Savior's birth. There are some among us who also have complicated relationships with our biological families. There are those who, just like the shepherds, are also symbols of dishonor. There are those for whom no place for them at the inn feels like a shockingly familiar experience. There are those whose minds and bodies orient them to loving someone of the same gender, yet there is no place for them at Christmas dinner. Is there a place for them at our inn? There are those who have fled partners who abuse them, and this Christmas is significantly less cheery with few gifts and kids who wonder if Santa will find them in this new place. Is there room for them at our inn? There are those living alone and whose families live on the other side of the country and even the world, and their Christmas night is just a bit too silent. Is there room for them at our inn? And just like Mary, Joseph, and Jesus depicted in Kelly Lattimore's holy family in the streets, we have our own holy family and modern shepherds living in shanties and tents on 12th Street, in our parks, under overpasses, and they strive to not only survive, but to re be received by us with dignity and honor as participants in our society, as worshipers in our, in our churches. And they are the embodiment of Christ among us. Oakland City Church, is there room for them at our end? In his book, God of the Oppressed, theologian Dr. James Cohn says this, the Christian community, therefore, is that community that freely becomes oppressed because they know that Jesus himself has defined humanity's liberation in the context of what happens to the little ones. Christians join the cause of the oppressed in the fight for justice, not because of some philosophical principle of the good, or because of the religious feeling of sympathy for people in prison, sympathy does not change the structures of injustice. The authentic identity of Christians with the poor is found in the claim which the Jesus encounter lays upon their own lifestyle, a claim that connects the word Christian with liberation of the poor. Christians fight not for humanity in general, but for themselves and out of their love for concrete human beings. Did you hear that? 
The word Christian should be associated with the liberation of the poor. I wonder what words would come to mind across the country for those who outside our faith, if they were asked, what do you associate Christians with? Would it be the liberation of the poor? Oakland City Church, we have made the audacious, radical, bold claim that we are a people who don't belong together, gathered around Jesus for the sake of those who don't belong. We are a people gathered together for the sake of the poor around Jesus, for the sake of those who don't belong. We are to be a place where there is always room at our inn. And we have already done so much for so many who need room. And who are the other Josephs and Marys in our midst? Who are the dishonored shepherds who no one else will commune with but to whom God calls favored? Are we those who have privilege willing to become oppressed, as Dr. Cohn says, in order that we might be the room at the inn? Are we about the liberation of the poor and the economy of God? Are we willing to become less so that others might become more? These are some really daunting questions to ask. I know for so many of us, Oakland City Church has been a refuge. This church has embodied diversity and embraced difference. This place has been love for countless individuals over the years. OCC has been family when there has been no other family to be found, and how good this is. And family, I say we're just getting warmed up. This city is filled with people who feel the rest of the world has passed them by. But we know that God sees all of them. We know this because we have sensed God's warming, loving gaze on us too. Let us draw closer to God by drawing closer to those whom God has particular care for. And let us make room for the shepherds, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus around us, just as God has made room for us. Church, God has brought good news of great joy for all people. And let us go out to the world that we might be it and that we might receive it in all of the unexpected places. Amen.
incarnate deity, all infinity enfolded in an instant, embodied in this instant. We've been waiting all this while for just this child, meek and mild. A royalty's reception, Christ's very first collection, an ominous offering, they brought the end to the beginning, and we say amen even though it isn't finished. His better straw did not diminish the sanctity of what they witnessed. Though the government dismissed it, this mystery persisted, tugging at the hearts of those who resisted, turning stone to flesh through the spirit's insistence. What wondrous love is this that joins us in our humanness, housed in flesh and bones, so we know we're not alone. What wondrous love is this that joins us in our humanness, housed in flesh and bones, so we know we're not alone. much, Max and Lydia, for your offering this morning. Oakland City Church, you are free to go and spend the rest of the day with your friends and family. Thank you for beginning it with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the countenance of the Lord be upon you and give you peace this Christmas season. Amen. <laughs>